Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Tom Verbele, one of the cardiac surgeons here at the University Hospitals in Leuven, and we are going to, to do a double valve replacement uh, with the Avalis aortic valve and the mosaic mitral valve in a 75-year-old patient. And I'm going to do this together with uh, the team here uh, at the table. It consists here of a 75-year-old male. He has a history of a third degree uh, atrioventricular block for which he received an implantation of a micro, a micro uh, pacemaker a few months ago. In his previous history, much remarkable, some hypercholesterolemia, arterial hypertension, and a prostate carcinoma, which has been resected uh, about five years ago. Recently, he presented with some pre syncopus and some uh, uh, complaints of tired legs and exertional dyspnea. Further investigations then showed on the echocardiogram a patent foramen ovale and an ejection fraction of 55%. When we look at the mitral valve, we see a diffuse calcified annulus. The anterior leaflet is clearly thickened with also a thickened posterior leaflet, which shows, shows a prolapse of P2 and P3. Uh, with some flail. The subvalvular apparatus is calcified uh, with clearly also some elongation of the cordae uh, on the ventricular side. Uh, there was no stenosis, but so we see uh, a mitral insufficiency of three to four on four uh, within an eccentric uh, left atrial oriented jet. Looking at the aortic valve, the cusps were clearly calcified with a moderate stenosis and aortic valve area of about 1.1 square centimeter and there was no aortic insufficiency with normal uh, diameters as well of the ascending aorta. Tricuspid valve was just looked at, is not leaking and is not dilated. So the plan is to replace the both valves, the mitral and the uh, aortic valve. The gradient over the aortic valve. And we see a P gradient of 39 millimeters of mercury and a mean gradient of 60 millimeters of mercury. This is defined as a moderate aortic valve stenosis. So here you can see a zoomed image, cross-section of the aortic valve. And you can see that the valve is originally tricuspid, but that there is severe calcification at the border between the non-coronary cusp and the right coronary cusp. And you see that the non-coronary cusp is quite immobilized. It's not moving. So you see that the opening of the valve during contraction of the ventricle exists between the non so exists between the left and the right coronary cusp and the opening is a little bit narrowed this causes the moderate grade of stenosis here you see the same um, aortic valve in the long axis view and you can also see that upper leaflet in this picture is the non-coronary cusp is not moving during contraction this causes the aortic valve stenosis the same image with color flow doppler and you see that during contraction we have turbulent flow in the aortic ascendance which is caused by the narrowed valvular opening long axis view with the anterior leaflet quite moving well, but you see that the posterior leaflet, there's something wrong. There's a lot of calcification and that calcified region pulls, I think here it is the P2 leaflet upwards, preventing its normal action. Here you see the same image with color flow Doppler and you can see that there is a mitral valve insufficiency. Here also with a very large jet in posterior direction here as well. So the opening of the valve is not a problem, but especially the uh, closing during systolic contraction. Then I made a 3D image of the uh, mitral valve. At the upper part of the valve, you see the anterior leaflet, and at the lower part, you can see the posterior leaflet. And there we, there we have a very large calcified region at the posterior annulus especially uh, at the level of P2 and P3. Clem staat, adenocor mag gegeven worden. Cardioplegia can run. So now I will open the right atrium immediately. And so you can see clearly the cardioplegia coming in, which we then evacuate. And we now have as you can see on the ECG, a cardiac arrest.
I always orient my incision a little bit towards the non-coronary cusp. Twee keer backhand nu. Ja. It's a calcified valve. And we will resect the leaflets now. Yeah. It appears that it's mainly the non-coronary cusp that has been calcified in the most extensive way. It doesn't make sense to, uh, to already uh, do the sizing because we can still have some deformation of the aortic annulus after our uh, mitral valve uh, implantation. So here we have the fossa ovale. And as you can see here, I can easily enter the left atrium. So this is the uh, patent foramen ovale, which we also, of course also have to close. So, uh, but we'll make our incision the same way. As you can see, completely calcified here. There's some calcification on the subvalvular apparatus as well. And especially the posterior analysis is calcified. And given the age of the patient, which is 75, we will not attempt to do a repair, but we will replace the valve. So I will now remove the complete anterior leaflet. In normal circumstances, I try to leave the largest part of the posterior valve, which is here certainly possible for P1, but for P, especially for P3, I need to do some decalcification, so I will have to remove it because the calcification is just too much. We are approaching P1, which I left in place because it was not calcified. And I will, of course, try to take the tip of the leaflet within my stitch so we can preserve the subvalvular apparatus of the uh, posterior leaflet, which I could not do for P2 and P3 because they were so heavily calcified that they narrowed the ring too much. So I'm giving a, a shot of retrograde cardioplegia now. It took me a bit more time because we had to decalcify the posterior annulus. So the man is 1 meter 64, which is not that big. Here I can easily enter with a 31 size. No, it will be... It will be too big. I think uh, the 31 was uh, actually a nice fit, as you could see. So we'll go for 31. What you can always do if you have to combine it is put your finger through the mitral, sort through, through the arctic annulus. You can see it now here uh, appearing, so you know where the LVOT is. Normally, we're going to use uh, the marker on the mosaic valve. Uh, oriented towards the right trigone, or what I call around two o'clock, which was uh, for me uh, this stitch. So this is the valve, and as you can see, there's a marker here, which means that in contrast to uh, other uh, bioprosthetic valves or the mitral valve, uh, this on the left side, uh, the leaflet is a little bit larger. It's not three times 120 degrees, but this one is 135 degrees which means that the um, area in front of the left ventricular outflow tract is uh, larger. Another advantage is uh, this clinch system, which makes it possible to shrink the valve uh, on the subvalvular part, which is of mainly uh, very nice when you do minimal invasive procedures, but also here it's very nice to avoid um, loop entanglements. Let's start. Uh, we're going to use, as I said before, this one, which is on two o'clock or the right trigone to put it here. Now, very much like the large sewing ring, which is not only uh, a little bit sealing, but it also gives a nice feeling to put the stitches through. Mm. 
Of course, some of your stitches are a little bit larger than the other ones, and I try to put the same distance on the ring of the uh, prosthetic valve as well as I've done in the uh, on the annulus of the valve. Okay. The lower side is always a little bit more difficult to see. Yeah, but now, as you might see, I can see really clearly see my pledgets as well. So I'm quite confident it's in the in the good position. Now I remove the handle, but I leave the blue part in place. So my valve is actually still a little bit shrinked while knotting. As you can see, the sutures and the pledgets are nicely around the ring. So to release the holder, there are three parts uh, that you have to cut with your knife. Uh, so one, two, three. And then with a little bit counter pressure on the side of the valve, you can easily remove it. So we can easily check now, but it's very tight. Sorry. Okay, and we are actually already finished with the mitral valve implantation. By orienting the mosaic valve with the foreseen uh, mark uh, towards the right trigone, and by checking with my finger, I have actually a perfect position of the mosaic valve, and there is no obstruction at all of the left ventricular outflow tract. Sizer uh, 23. 21. It's a small male. So we measured 23. This is 23, but probably it will be, it has been a little bit narrowed by implanting the mitral valve. And as you can see, indeed, although I have the impression that if I push very hard, the barrel would go through, it's, I don't, I don't dare to do this. So the barrel of the 21 is easily going through. And the difference with other valves is that you always have to check with your, um, uh, replica as well so and the replica is nicely here and you can see clearly that it goes on the annulus so we will choose for uh, a 21 so i'm going to place three commissarial stitches first uh, so i put my uh, patches on the ventricular side and the ones in the commissure are a little bit lower because of course the valve implantation ring is just a circular shape so now we start with implanting the Avalus valve, chosen a 21. Yeah, 75 year old male with uh, a length of 1 meter 64. So that's why I also accept to use a 21. Uh, in other circumstances, I would maybe have to consider to um, make an enlargement of the root. Given the age and the size of the patient, uh, I did not. The Avalus valve, I like very much because there is this uh, material uh, of which the stent is made that makes it undeformable. And especially if you knot other commercially available stented valves with your hands, you might deform the stenting, which is certainly not the case here. Uh, we have five stitches huh? in total in between. So as you can see, uh, I'm giving retrograde cardioplegia now. Turn the... yeah. You should always try to place your sutures as close as possible uh, to the ring so that the sutures inside the cuff are well as close to the ring as possible and then um, the sewing cuff actually comes up once implanted. So now I'm checking the position, but the commissures are very good. Our coronary ostia are completely free. And it seems we have the valve in a very good position. I used the holder to put uh, the valve in the right position, and I'm quite confident it is in the right position. So now I will remove the holder. Always I use some counterforce on one of the 
material parts of the valve. And so the holder is removed. And as the height of my commissures is exactly the same as on, as on my prosthetic valve, I'm quite confident about the positioning. For suturing, we will again use core nuts. I'm now using the core nuts because I think in general, in every stented valve, it might be better because, well, you always have the risk when you <coughs> just tie the nuts with your hands to damage the, um, the prosthetic valve. Of course, that it is less an issue with the Avalus valve, as I've said before, because uh, the material of which it's made, it's not deformable. And this is, of course, not the case in some other valves. Uh, but still, uh, I think uh, the main advantage, uh, except of uh, not trying to damage the valve, is, of course, a little time uh, gain you have with uh, using the core nuts. You can clearly see how uh, the suturing part here, the suturing cuff actually, is uh, folding up. Now on the non-coronary cusp side, I always try to work from the side towards the middle. So I never will suture it from one side to the other. So for example, I do two now on the right side of this cusp, and then I go to the left side of the cusp. So the main tension in the end will be divided across the cusp and I end in the middle. And as you can see, of course, I think it's clearly visible now, the Avalus valve has a very nice and low profile, uh, which makes it, of course, a very attractive valve to be used. Final check. So I think everything looks fine. You can see the, again, the mitral valve prosthesis, the, the mosaic valve. I don't see any struts, so Positioning is very fine, no obstruction of the LVOT. Final control with the nerve hook. But I'm quite confident because I saw folding the sewing cuff almost everywhere. So here you can see the mitral valve prosthesis, one of the leaflets uh, with the venting that is going through. And you can see, clearly see that there is no obstruction at all of the left ventricular outflow tract. So I am quite confident that the result will be okay. So now we are back with the same 3D image, but after the surgery. So what you see is the bioprothesis. We look at it from the atrium downwards to the valve. You see the leaflets moving, opening and closing. And you see also the stitches which the surgeon used to attach the valve. Here again, the same image. You have a clear view of the, the stitches. And here we used color flow to exclude um, the presence of paravalvular leakages. And you can see that there is no paravalvular leakage. Then I went back to the ventricle. And you can see after the procedure that we have a very good contractile function of the left ventricle. These are 2D views, color flow Doppler of the mitral valve. It's of course uh, the prosthesis that you can see. And you, you see the, the laminar flow during diastole and no insufficiency during systole. Here I measured the gradient over the valve. You can see that the peak gradient is just seven millimeters of mercury, which is almost nothing. I also measured a mean gradient through the valve and it's only three millimeters of mercury, which is very minor. What I show you here is a postoperative deep transgastric view of the aortic valve. This is the same image with color flow. Here you can see a uh, continuous Doppler over that bioprosthesis. And you can see that we still have a little bit of gradient, but I have to mention that at this time point, we had a very high cardiac output, but this, this can have influenced the, uh, the measurements, making them higher than they are in normal conditions. And if you look at the new prosthesis in short axis, you can see that the opening of the valve is way bigger than it was before surgery. I would like to thank the whole uh, team that participated very well. And of course, I would like to thank you for watching this. Thank you.